Do I need it quiet in the courtroom, please? We are back on the record. Um, appearances are as they were before, except that Mr. Brooks has been uh, removed to the other courtroom. Um, the court did that because we came out on the record at 2 o'clock following the <coughs> lunch break. Uh, Mr. Brooks was brought to the main courtroom. Um, and during that almost 35 minutes or so, he was insistent on raising a variety of legal issues with which this court has either previously addressed or which are meritless and do not uh, warrant any further response. He is insistent on making a record and an offer of proof. Um, this would not be the appropriate procedural mechanism, meaning an offer of proof at this time. We are not in the midst of a trial where the courts made an evidentiary ruling that would require the preservation of the record by making an offer of proof. Um, this court uh, has been attempting, frankly, all day to get through the reading of jury instructions, to get to the point where the parties make their closing arguments, and ultimately to put this case in the jury's hands. It has been challenging. It has been met uh, by resistance from Mr. Brooks. Um, I would once again describe it as being stubbornly defiant, although at times he may wait for me to uh, make my ruling. He, c he continues to not respect the fact that a ruling has been made, and he wants to argue and re-argue and re-argue points that this court has already gone over. And in an effort to simply put him on notice regarding his behavior, given the history of this case, uh, the court was attempting to set some parameters regarding closing arguments so that they are focused, so that they are proper, um, and that they follow the law. That was met with a considerable amount of resistance and repeated statements by Mr. Brooks that he has um, First Amendment rights, Sixth Amendment rights, Fourteenth Amendment rights. He has all of those rights. That is not in dispute. But those rights do not come in a vacuum when we are in a court uh, proceeding and a trial such as this. Um, the rules of evidence, the rules of procedure, the rules of courtesy and decorum all <coughs> apply. And this case has demonstrated that a stubbornly defiant defendant can forfeit even important constitutional rights by conduct. Uh, that includes the right to be present. It included the right to present further witnesses and testimony. And it included the right of the defendant to testify on his own behalf. I hope that I do not have to go through um, a decision that forfeits his right or that makes a finding that he's forfeited his right to make a closing argument. I will certainly uh, wait and see how that goes. I would note he was very respectful when he did his opening statement. Um, it was clear. He made a variety of points. Um, he did so in a way that I would say was very um, conscientious of people's time. It was cogent. It was concise. It was probably about 35 minutes. I may be off a little bit, but that's what my memory is. It wasn't overly lengthy. Um, I would hope that he follows some of those same things here when he does his closing argument. But he has been removed from this courtroom because of his stubborn defiance and disrespect of this court of courtesy and decorum um, and what I truly believe is an effort on his part to continue to delay and lengthen these proceedings. Um, I've said it before, I'll state it again. Um, it is essential to the proper administration of criminal justice that dignity, order, and decorum be the hallmarks of all court proceedings in our country. The flagrant disregard in the courtroom of elementary standards of proper conduct should not and cannot be tolerated. And trial courts and trial judges that are confronted with disruptive, contemptuous, stubbornly defiant defendants must be given sufficient discretion to meet the circumstances of each case. 
No one formula for maintaining the appropriate courtroom atmosphere will be best in all situations. They noted three constitutionally permissible ways to handle such a stubbornly defiant defendant, um, but they also indicated that no one formula for maintaining the appropriate court atmosphere will be best in all situations. I've noted this before, this is a case from 1970, the technology that we now have in this brand new courtroom was not available then. Um, I have the ability to have Mr. Brooks appear from the other courtroom by way of audio and visual means. We can see him, he can see us. I've confirmed prior to calling the case that the audio was working, that the video is working. Uh, the one camera, there's four cameras in my courtroom, there's four cameras in his courtroom. However, it is set to one camera since he's the only individual there, um, other than the bailiffs, but I'm talking about as a party to the litigation. So the courtroom, the cameras in my courtroom include one that would normally be on the witness stand that has been zoomed out so as to capture uh, the large majority of the jury box. I even adjusted the camera that's on the state's table so that uh, the exhibit that's currently up uh, to the my left, her right, Attorney Opper, is uh, viewable uh, in the camera angle. Um, and uh, she is still present with it, meaning viewable within that as well. Um, and although I've made a finding that he has forfeited his right to be present for the state's closing argument, I'll find that the technology that I have available, uh, it is the f that his appearance from the other courtroom is the functional equivalent of appearing in this courtroom and being present uh, due to the uh, technology that is available. Um, I do have him on mute for the time being because I needed to make a record and there is a very lengthy history with Mr. Brooks during this case of him talking over me and my inability to make an adequate record if I am in a constant uh, back and forth with him and trying to talk over him. And so I, yes, made the decision to utilize the mute function on the incoming audio. I know he disagrees with my ability to do that, but I believe it is consistent with um, ensuring dignity, order, and decorum uh, that when appropriate, he be muted. I will advise Mr. Brooks once again that although he has lost his right to be present uh, in this courtroom, he can reclaim the right to be present as soon as he is willing to conduct himself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concepts of courts and judicial proceedings. That includes not interrupting the court. That includes respecting when the court renders a decision by way of an oral ruling, even if he disagrees with it. Um, so with that, um, I will advise him that once the jury is brought out, I will unmute him. I expect that he will be respectful of them, and I expect that he will not interrupt as the court goes through the uh, couple of final jury instructions I need to go through, uh, including the reading of uh, jury instruction 160, closing arguments of the parties. And then I will turn it over to the state, but I will unmute him at that point. So should he have an objection, he will be able to state objection. I will be able to rule on it. And again, I expect him to honor whatever the ruling that is made. And if he does not do that, then I will utilize the mute function. Um, if he doesn't have it, we'll make sure he has the objection sign. And if I see that, I will unmute him to hear what it is and then make a ruling accordingly. Attorney Hopper. Your Honor, uh, two quick things. Please, could you confirm that the audio and video are working in the next courtroom? And the clerk's shaking your head. They've done that. Thank you. I don't know if you want to do it now or at a later time, but I think we should make a record as I will be displaying a PowerPoint during my closing argument, throughout my closing argument, and I'm not sure 
how that is projected in the next room or how it affects what we see in this room, Your Honor, but we should make a record of that at some point. Thank you. My understanding is Madam Clerk has the ability, uh, so that is displayed not only here, but in the neighboring courtroom. Um, if you would be so kind as when you start displaying it, just make some type of record, <clears throat> excuse me, so that the bailiff who's over there, if it's not being properly viewable, if it's not viewable, um, that we can stop and adjust sure. accordingly. Okay. Thank you. If you would like before the jury comes out, we could do a test. Yes, could we please? Please. Madam Clerk, would you confirm with the clerk over there that uh, the PowerPoint is also viewable? They can see it. All right, and it should be the sim similarly to what we see. So the monitors will uh, display uh, the camera that Mr. Brooks is appearing, that is on Mr. Brooks on the left-hand side of the TV, and then the four cameras for this courtroom are on the right-hand side, but it's probably a, maybe a quarter to a third of the screen, and then the remainder of the screen is the PowerPoint. The monitors in the courtroom that Mr. Brooks is in are no different than what they are here. He would have one at the table, but he would also there would also be the very, very large TV monitor above the clerk over there. Well, it's smaller, and then the very large one over the witness stand. So it would be very similar to what is here um, if he were present in this courtroom. And again, I've, uh, I know that the diagram um, it's probably not the most easily seen from a camera, but it's really no different than what I'm looking at at the moment. Um, so I appreciate you asking that I make a record of that. Um, I would further make a record that there are headphones on the table where Mr. Brooks is currently standing. He has not put them on, um, but they are available should he want them. All right, then are you turning off the all right, PowerPoint? Let us know when you need that function, and then Madam Clerk will be able to um, make that viewable in both courtrooms. Very good, thank you. All right, with that, the jury is to be brought out. <clears throat> I'll rise for the jury, please. Thank you everyone, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when I read the jury instruction to you previously regarding credibility, I had a prior version of the jury instruction. Now what I read to you at, in the very beginning, or at the very beginning of this case was the most recent. I am going to read a short paragraph, but also tell you that in the packet that will be sent with the jurors to the jury deliberation room, it will have the complete instruction, and it's instruction number 30, 300, excuse me. And this is what I want you to know about credibility. In your determination of credibility, you must avoid any and all bias based on the witness's race, national origin, religion, age, ability, gender identity, sexual orientation, education, 
income level, or any other personal characteristic. Consider carefully the closing arguments of the parties, but their arguments and conclusions and opinions are not evidence. Draw your own conclusions from the evidence and decide upon your verdict according to the evidence under the instructions given you by the court. With that, I will ask Attorney Opper to start with her closing argument. Go ahead. Hold on one second. Mr. Brooks, do you have an objection? Nothing I, thought I, was supposed to, I thought I was supposed to be unmuted. You are now. All right. Uh, Attorney Opper, you may start. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, everybody. It's kind of nice to stand here in the middle of the courtroom. You know, all week or the last three weeks, they shoved me at the end of the table because I'm the lefty in the group. It's nice to be able to look at you all and say thank you truly thank you each and every one of you i want to express our sincere gratitude from the prosecution team myself deputy district attorney leslie basie assistant district attorney zach woodshell there's no one in this courtroom that does not realize the sacrifice that you've made serving your community in this very important task you've put your lives on hold I don't even want to hear from your bosses. Thank you. You've watched these proceedings and you've noticed as we sit at our prosecution table, we don't have a client at our table. But rest assured, we do represent someone. We represent the people of the state of Wisconsin. It's an entity. I can't bring it to the courtroom. People enact laws. People want to feel safe. People have representatives in Madison or Washington, D.C. that set standards, rules, that we all are expected to live by. And when those rules are violated, prosecutors step in and enforce the law. Daryl Brooks does not represent anybody. He does not have a client. Daryl Brooks is the client. Daryl Brooks is the defendant. The state of Wisconsin is the plaintiff. It's really that simple. And it's consistent with any other criminal case you've ever heard about at any other time in any other jurisdiction. It runs the same, no matter what state, state or federal. I'm gonna ask you for your guilty vote at the end of my comments. It's up to you. I can't tell you to do anything, except I'm going to say one thing to you that I wholeheartedly ask you to obey. Attorney Upper, I'm sorry for the interruption. Your objection, sir? A mischaracterization of who I am and the way it was said, I feel like it was talking down. All right, your objections noted, it's overruled. The state may continue. You must not, not, not consider anything about Daryl Brooks other than his conduct in downtown Waukesha on the evening of November 21, 2021. Nothing he's done before that, nothing he's done since that. When you go back to that deliberation room, please obey Judge Doro. Confine your comments to his conduct on November 21 of 21. Is he guilty of the 76 counts that he's been charged with? That and solely that should be your topic of discussion. So, what are the charges against Daryl Brooks? Thank you for your patience in listening to the jury instructions. They must be read for each and every count. But sadly, 
they can be summarized very quickly like this as far as the actual counts. Counts one through six are first degree intentional homicide while armed with a dangerous weapon. Counts seven through 67, first degree recklessly endangering safety while armed with a dangerous weapon. Counts 68 through 74, hit and run causing death. Counts 75 and 76, bail jumping, and count 77, battery. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mr. Brooks, what is your objection? Um, I have 76 charges, not 77. It's a mischaracter it's, mischaracterization of the charges. Uh, that is correct. It is uh, sustained. It should be count 68 through 73, I believe, and then 74 through 75, and then 76. Thank you, Your Honor. I do apologize for my math skills. 68 through 73. 74 and 75 are bail jumping and 76 is battery. I apologize for that misstatement. We're gonna talk about counts one through 67 in detail. Counts 68 through 73, hit and run causing death, in my opinion are easily summarized as this. He never stopped, never. Bail jumping, he was out on bail for two files in Milwaukee County facing felony charges there. He was ordered to not commit any further crimes. If you believe he can, uh, was involved in any of the conduct charging counts one through 67, you should find him guilty of bail jumping. Battery, that relates to the split lip and black eye suffered by Erica Peterson. We told the story kind of backwards. We started with the battery for background. First degree intentional homicide. You've seen this in our opening statement. You've heard it from Judge Doro. Did Daryl Brooks cause the death of the victim, a victim? Did he have, I'm sorry, did he act with intent to kill, meaning either the mental purpose to take the life of another or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being? Count one, Ginny Sorensen. Count two, Lee Owen. Count three, Tamara Durand. Oh, I got, I got. Count four, Jane Kulik, count five, Bill Hospital, <clears throat> count six, Jackson Sparks. Those are the individuals who lost their lives because of the conduct of Daryl Brooks. From there we go to reckless endangering safety. What is that? In this case, it means that through his reckless driving, he endangered the safety of other people. And he did so demonstrating utter disregard for human life. Now, behind me is State's Exhibit 15. It's also on the PowerPoint. If you choose, you may have this chart with you in the deliberation room to help you walk through each of these counts if you find it helpful. It's up to you. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. But it will be available for you if you ask for it. And it'll take you, as we did in our presentation of the case, right down Main Street and address all the counts that were involved, all the counts that were charged. To prove reckless endangering safety, and I'm just gonna go back one slide, Nowhere do you see there that we have to prove any degree of injury to anyone. Never once did Je Judge Doe instruct you that somebody has to be physically injured. Now, Detective Casey told you that was the standard we used in deciding of all these hundreds of thousands of people who is included in these charges. 
and a decision was made by the prosecution team to include people who were physically injured to be efficient in our prosecution. And so everybody up and down the street, I would argue, had their safety in danger that day. I didn't charge 5,000 counts. We selected 60, 61 counts of people that we can identify by name in Exhibit 15 that were injured by the conduct of Mr. Brooks. Those are the people in green, people in red are the fatalities. And we presented this case to you in much the same fashion that is presented here on Exhibit 15 as to how the injuries occurred going down that street. So we are absolutely held to our burden of proof and the elements for each offense that Judge Doro instructed you on, but we are not required to prove any injury to anybody. The question is, was their safety endangered by his reckless conduct, his reckless driving? <coughs> now, some of the groups, it's pretty easy. They walked in a formation and you can get a photograph or a diagram and you can kind of see pretty easily who was located where, right? And you can think back to the videos that you've seen for each of these groups and remember, and you'll see them again, the path of the vehicle as it went through each of these groups. This is South Band, of course. All of these names that are being displayed on the PowerPoint Exhibit 21 are on Exhibit 15 in green for Waukesha South Band. Pretty much the whole left half of the formation was endangered by the safety of Daryl Brooks driving up the side of that band. The extreme dance team, it's a little difficult to read, but again, this chart was marked as an exhibit. It's exhibit number 33. If you want it, you can have it in the jury room. The names on this chart will match the names for the extreme dance team on States Exhibit 15. All of the girls that were struck and injured as they marched with the extreme dance team, plus some people on the back that were handing out candy or serving in support roles as the uh, unit made its way down the street. The dancing grannies. States Exhibit 54, the formation that they marched in, who was located where, and your recollection of how that SUV zigzagged through that group. And you can just see the names and match it up to who was injured and killed versus who wasn't. Now, one of the big things in this case has always been why did this happen? What was he thinking? Why did he do this? Again, those are things I don't necessarily have to prove to you. His intent, I do have to prove, and I submit without any doubt, there's overwhelming evidence that this was an intentional act by Daryl Brooks and an act of utter disregard for human life. I say that for these reasons, folks. Number one, first and foremost, just stop driving. That's it. It's really that simple. Not one person had to be hurt that day if he would have just stopped driving. Um, you specifically, can, I'm sorry, can can I be heard? Your objection, sir? Oh, I didn't, I didn't know if I was on mute or not. Um, You're not? You, you specifically said in your jury instructions that 
intent cannot be you can't look into someone's mind i think is what it says to find intent so how could that be characterized as someone knowing for sure intent or not knowing for sure intent you're making an argument you'll have an opportunity to do that later your objections noted it's overruled the state may continue i apologize we we showed you at the very beginning, remember our first witness was Sergeant Warner, the man who was the incident commander for the parade. We put up another map. I think it states Exhibit 1. You can have that if you want it. Shows all the positions of all the police officers and the reserve officers, the barricades, the squad cars. How do I know it was intentional? Because even Daryl Brooks told Detective Carpenter, I could tell something was going on downtown. No reasonable person would drive upon this area, see the squads with their red and blues on, see the officers in the street with their bright yellow vests, see all the people milling around, see the, pl the floats lining up and the participants getting ready and not know to drive safely, slowly, and obey officers. The barricades help us prove it was intentional. The police presence help us prove it's intentional. The parade participants help us prove it's intentional. And the parade spectators help us prove it's intentional. Excuse me, Attorney Apple, your objection, sir? Speculation as to what the alleged defendant said he saw, it, Sir, it was never. Your objections noted it's overruled. This is closing arguments, not the evidentiary phase. Go ahead and so turn how it can, So how can speculation be made to what was saw? If your that objections was noted, to? it's overruled. Continue, Attorney Opper. Honking the horn. Quite interesting that Mr. Brooks asked so many witnesses if they heard the horn honking. Some of them said they did at the beginning of the parade. Yeah, I heard a horn honk. Most of them said they didn't. The horn honking cuts both ways, folks. If he's honking his horn, that means he can see something's in front of him. That means he knows there's an object in the road. You can rely on your common experience in your affairs of everyday life. If you see something in the road and you want to alert the other person to your presence, you will honk. But you do not have the green light to then just keep going if they don't move. He knew they were there. Intent. I've skipped one. I'm sorry. Going back to my street. Number 15, I failed to include the uh, Catholic community. That's just one of the photographs showing the people that will match up to Exhibit 15 from the Catholic community of Waukesha. There's a lot of photographs identifying the people that were marching with that group. The parade started. This is the starting point or at least near the beginning, right? This is the area. We showed some videos of the groups passing by in this area. We heard testimony from four different police officers standing in four different spots near here telling of their four different efforts to stop him. Intentional. Sergeant Wanner's back here, testified that this red SUV blew by me. I waved both arms over my head. I'm in a police uniform. I have an unmarked squad, but I have my red and blues on. And he blew past me. He gets down here to the corner where Detective Casey is standing. Detective Casey runs out into the street, gets close enough to put his hand on the hood of the car. He keeps going. He comes down, turns on the Main Street, gets in this area of East Avenue to the south and Buckley Street to the north. This is where he encounters Officer Schneider and Officer Buttrin. They each make a separate effort to stop him and he keeps going. 
four police officers. It's intentional. He had plenty of opportunity to just stop anywhere along the way. One of the officers testified to it. I think it was Officer Schneider. This was an accident, and he mistakenly wandered onto the parade route after passing all this, and he mistakenly wandered onto the parade route. At any point, all he had to do was stop. They could have paused the parade. They could have moved the barricades and escorted him out. He didn't. It was intentional. He went on for four blocks. Four blocks. It was intentional. He reached speeds of approximately 30 miles an hour. That's intentional. He plowed through 68 different people. 68. How can you hit one and keep going? How can you hit two and keep going? How can you hit three and keep going? Didn't phase him a bit. He kept going until he got to the end and there was no more bodies to hit. It's intentional. Mischaracterization of the evidence. Noted, overruled. His conduct when he left the parade route, we'll get into this. His flight, his hiding, his panic, his desperation to run. Get the hell out of town as fast as he could before the cops came. That shows his intent. His interview with Detective Carpenter, we spent several hours playing you snippets of that interview. How telling was that? Never once did he say any of these things. Never once did he say, like he told you in his opening statement, it wasn't an, ac it was an accident, it wasn't intentional. Never said that to Detective Carpenter. No, he came up with some convoluted story about, I got a ride out here from a buddy in a tan Kia, and then I left to go meet Erica, and we got into a fight, and then I went back, and the other guy got into a fight, and he was leaving, so I took off on foot. Absolutely nonsensical story. Does not match up with the known evidence in this case. Overruled. He never stopped. I didn't even state the objection. This is closing argument. She may continue. I'm going to play this slide, which is a snippet from State's Exhibit Number 53. Go ahead and play with sound, please. <laughs> It was just a snippet that I selected because I thought it really captured the environment that so many witnesses tried to explain to you, right? It's a Christmas parade. People are there with their families, their little kids, their grandkids, their neighbors, their friends, strangers, standing next to strangers. That's what's going on on Main Street. While that's going on on Main Street, this is going on. Remember this? This is the gas station on the corner of Barstow and North Street. While the units are marching down Main Street, entertaining the crowd, Daryl Brooks is driving recklessly. He's enraged and he's arguing with Erica Patterson. Why is this important? This is important because before he even gets to the parade route, 
this is how he's driving. He drives the wrong way down North Street and then acts like it's everybody else's fault in the world. Your objection is noted. It's overruled. You may continue, Attorney Opper. When he finally pulls into the gas station, he rolls down his window and yells at the driver who's properly stopped at the stoplight that it's somehow that guy's fault that Daryl Brooks is trying to drive the wrong way down North Street. And from there, the rage continues. We get to this point, States Exhibit number three. Please play. The video is playing. You can see the pushing match between Daryl Brooks, Corey Runkle, Erica Patterson, and Nick Kirby. Watch this. He turns to get in the car, flips up his hood, and goes and gets in the passenger seat. I'm sorry, driver's seat. How long are we going to mischaracterize testimony? Sir's argument, I've heard nothing improper. Your objection's noted, it's overruled. You may continue, Attorney Opper. Thank you. They need to know they can nullify. That's it. He drives off onto the parade route. From this moment, right here on Exhibit 15, you're watching it. He's enraged, he's angry, flips up that hood, and he zooms past Sergeant Warner, past Officer Casey, onto the parade route. Now, there's no doubt for the first two blocks, he does not strike anyone. And as we've discussed, some even said he was driving at a reasonable speed initially. By the time he gets past Officer Buttron and Officer Schneider in this area here of uh, East Avenue, past East Avenue. And clearly once he gets past Barstow, that's where it starts, right? That's where it starts. Nicole White, our first victim, walking with Remax and the hot air balloon. Knocks her over, keeps going, runs up and over the backs of Waukesha South Band, hits the green children spectating on the sidewalk, keeps going, runs over Kelly Grabo and her daughter Adelia walk, walking with Burris Logistics, keeps going, plows through the entire extreme dance team just before the five points, keeps going, hits Deborah Ramirez and her son Isaac spectating on the south side of the street, keeps going, clears the five points area, hits Jane Kulik, square on, causing her to go up on the hood of the car, and then fall off and drives over her body. He doesn't stop, he keeps going. Runs through the kids over by the steaming cup. We heard parents testify about little Brinley and Kelsey and Owen that were standing there outside the steaming cup. They were struck by the red SUV, driven by Daryl Brooks. Keeps going, plows through the grannies in that zigzag fashion, striking most of them injuring them, killing them, keeps going, gets down here to the end and goes through the uh, Catholic community. The witness, uh, remember Holly Berg, she testified about that um, mobile gas station incident. She said she was standing down here in this area. She said, I saw 15 to 20 people fly in the air they look like bowling pins. And when she saw the video, she's absolutely right. It's a terrible description when you think these are human beings, but 
That's exactly what it looked like. When does the intent exist? It doesn't have to be even for a second. I'm not telling you who set out that morning to cause this carnage. But when he became enraged back here, he didn't give a damn who or what was in his way. He intentionally went on. I'll show you. Motive. I don't know why he did this. Folks, I don't know why, other than the rage. He's right. You cannot read minds, neither can I. But the law doesn't require you to. The law gives you a way to reach a conclusion as to what is somebody thinking, and it's right here. Decide it based on his acts, words, and statements, and from all of the facts and circumstances. I've already been through many of them. I want to show you what I mean. Look at this. Was there room for him to get out? This is way back at the beginning. This is Officer Buttrin's squad video. Way back at the beginning. That's Buckley Street here that you're looking at. Look at those barricades. Look at the sparse crowd. And there's Officer Schneider in her uh, yellow fluorescent vest on the left side of the picture, about to run into the street and stop him. <coughs> Intent. I'm gonna play this video for you because folks, for me, this is where it becomes crystal clear. When you watch this video, the first thing you're gonna see if you direct your attention to the left side of the screen is you're going to see him hit Kelly, I'm sorry, Nicole White. Knock her to the ground and keep going. Now, if that was the end of the story, you may sit here and say, Madam DA, I, I don't know how you conclude intent from that. Maybe it was an accident. Maybe he didn't mean to do it. But watch what happens in this video after he knocks Nicole White down and tell me this does not prove intent. Please play. watching the left side of your screen. Out of the same thing. That's intent. I'm sorry to interrupt your objection, sir. How can you tell the jury what they're supposed to think? It's proper argument. Your objection is noted. It's overruled. It's, I would argue that it's I would, I would say that it's improper, and I Mr. move Brooks, for Mr. Brooks, I made my ruling. I'm going to mute you if you don't follow the rules. Exhibit one. Exhibit 152. Clearly intentional conduct. Clearly intentional conduct. States Exhibit 93. We asked the court to take time to have you go look at this car in person because it's remarkably amazing <coughs> that this damage was caused by human beings. That's intent. This is an excerpt from State's Exhibit 154. Maybe a little hard to see. A lot of that laying in the front 
part of this uh, photo are shoes. Remember what Dr. Vidritsky said about the shoes and the feet, the scuff marks on the toes and the ankles? Look at all the shoes laying in the street. This is the area at the end when he ran through the Catholic community. All the shoes laying there because of the velocity, remember? The medical examiner talked about the velocity. It's not just the speed, it's the velocity. The power that these people were knocked right out of their shoes. That's intent. The flight, the hiding, changing his appearance. <coughs> he had to go through some effort, right? Crawled up in this uh, <coughs> playhouse, ditched his sweatshirt and his sandal, the other sandal. Seems pretty reasonable. He dropped it when he was jumping over a fence. Changed his appearance. Please play. Excuse me. Intent. What's he running from? What's he running from if he's just a lost guy with no ride back to Milwaukee? What's he running from as there's cops, sirens wailing in the background? Whoops, that was me. So, State's Exhibit number 130. Put that up here quickly. <coughs> Thank you. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, folks. Suffice it to say, after Officer Scolton tried to stop the threat at that intersection at the top, Wisconsin Avenue, and he blew through the barricades there, and drove south on West Avenue over to Prospect Court, cutting through the yards and ditching the vehicle on Maple. You heard all the testimony about the commotion on Maple. The eyewitness testimony from Officer Sailors, off-duty police officer who saw this, saw the defendant, Daryl Brooks, he identified him for you in this court, get out and run from this car, and how we tracked him through the neighborhood. And again, the desperation whether he had to ask or use veiled threats like, I won't hurt you, but I need your phone. He was absolutely desperate to get out of there until he took refuge in the home of Daniel Ryder. Now, remember the interesting thing, folks. None of these witnesses in this area knew anything about what happened at the parade. None of them. None of them were there. None of them were there. So they, some of them tried to help, some of them didn't. Daniel Ryder did, and it's actually probably a really good thing that he took him in because it stalled, right? It stalled him from keep running, kept him in one place until the cops could close in and get there. Now, Mr. Brooks repeatedly asked witnesses, who had just watched their loved ones get struck by this SUV if they happen to catch a license plate. States Exhibit 150, there's the front license plate. Definitely a little blurry, but definitely you can make it out. States Exhibit 151, there's the rear plate. States Exhibit 175, there's Daryl Brooks in his music video with the same car and the same license plate. <clears throat> There's the key to the Ford that was found in Daryl Brooks' pocket. There's no doubt Daryl Brooks is the person responsible for this. Because this man in this picture is the same as this man in this picture wearing this sweatshirt. And again, it's a little hard to see, but you can ask for these exhibits in the jury room if you want. The photograph, you can see this 
design on the front of the uh, sweatshirt if you look close enough. This is a sweatshirt from the playset that has Daryl Brooks DNA on it, according to the crime lab. That's him right there. That's Daryl Brooks driving off into the parade. That's Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. That's Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. That is also Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. And so is that. And he kept asking people about the tints on the window. Well, guess what, folks? You don't need to see the tints on the window when the windows are rolled down. And there's clearly one person in that vehicle in every one of these photos. And it's that man. And it's that man. And it's that man. Daryl Edward Brooks Jr., date of birth 2-21-1982, on his identification card issued by the state of Wisconsin. In all capital letters, Daryl Edward Brooks Jr. This was in his pocket when they arrested him. So this entire shenanigans that he's presented to you through his questioning of witnesses about I'm not Daryl Brooks and that's my name and I don't know who that is, and I don't uh, consent to being called that name. It's just nothing but a distraction. It's Daryl Brooks. It's the man who drove through the Waukesha Christmas Parade and killed people, injured people, endangered the safety of people. I'm sorry, your objection, sir? Uh. Your Honor, with all due respect, I, I would appreciate the uh, the quote unquote uh, language to, to what, what you mean by shenanigans and this and that and the third. Sir, your objections noted. It's overruled. The state may continue. Well, can can she tone that back? Because if that was me, if I would have said Mr. something Brooks, like that, Mr. Brooks, your objection is noted. It's overruled. These are closing arguments. There's nothing improper. It's noted. It's overruled. To, she may continue. I just wanted. I just wanted to be fair. You'll have an Honor, opportunity to respond, sir. Please let her finish. So I can, I can rebuttal. Go ahead, Attorney Opper. Thank you. I'm going to conclude my comments with this, folks. I'm going to show you the video, a stitched together video of all the carnage caused by Daryl Brooks, and I apologize. It's together. This is important that you know what he did. It's important that you think about the women like Nicole White and Kelly Grabo and her daughter and Jane Kulik who were just there with friends and co-workers supporting a local business. The teenagers marching in the band representing wearing their school colors. It's important the boys and girls with the Blazers baseball team and their coaches doing nothing more than handing out baseball cards. The young girls in the extreme dance team. Can you imagine how many hours they spent practicing that routine? He drove right through them without a care in the world. The grannies dancing their way down the street perfect step, every one of them. The Catholic community there, as Father Matt said, spreading the light of Christ in the weeks before Christmas. He snuffed it out. It's time for Daryl Brooks to stop running. It's time for him to stop lying. It's time for him to be held accountable for his actions. Daryl Brooks cowardly rammed his way through this parade, violently killing and injuring so many people. I'm going to stop talking and play this video, but please, I ask you to add up the evidence. Use the map, 150, I'm sorry, 15. You can check off the names. We've covered them all. Walk down that street like we did with you return guilty ver verdicts on all counts, please.
please. Screen back up. No, I need one more. Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Before we continue with Mr. Brooks's closing arguments, I'm going to take a short break. Um, I'll rise for the jury, please. I'm on duty. No. The jury should know that they can nullify. You are muted now. Thank you. We'll be in recess for about 10 minutes. <laughs> 